Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Between the Lines Live. Actually the first one for 2024, so uh, welcome back and Happy New Year and Happy Valentine's Day for those who are celebrating. Uh, my name is Vanessa Rader, I'm the Head of Research here at uh, Ray White. And um, I'm joined today by two great speakers. So it'll be great to see what's happened in 2023. We'll talk a little bit about that and what's going to happen looking forward. So firstly, we've got Samuel Hadjilis. Uh Sam is the Managing Director of RWC SC based here in our Sydney head office. Um, and we've got Stephen Scahill, Group Executive of Commercial Lending at LMG. So welcome, guys. Thanks, for Thanks, Vanessa. So exciting to start the year. So let's start by looking... Well, firstly, this year, starting off reasonably optimistic because we had those uh, inflation numbers that came out the other week start coming down a lot of people now all of a sudden talk about interest rate cuts which wasn't kind of people talking about so early in the piece um, just only a month ago so good news story so can you tell me a little bit uh, Sam we had a tough 2023 when it comes to commercial volumes were down it was a difficult market can you give me a bit of a wrap up of what you kind of felt during that that tail end of 2023 and sure. some thoughts of and then we'll take it forward of what's going to happen yeah absolutely i think 2023 like the two words that probably summarize that for me were challenging and inconsistent yeah it was challenging if you're uh, an agent if you're an owner if you're a buyer in the market for all the things that you just mentioned where there was a lot of sort of uncertainty around what was happening with interest rates Inflation was still obviously high and with there was no sign that it was immediately coming back despite these continual hikes. We had a lot of people say that they were really struggling to, even those that were interested in purchasing, were struggling to get finance. So we had a lot of, we had a, a, a big makeup which was just creating this market where people just weren't sure what to do. Yeah. I, I say when people cons- aren't sure, they do nothing. They, correct. <laughs> they so you had a lot of people that just said, you know what, yes, I'd like to buy, yes, I'd like to sell, but I'm just going to wait and see because I'm just not sure. Yeah. And as, as we moved through the year that we sort of kept having these little bumps and we forecast changed and no one was just 100% certain about where we were going. So I, feeling a bit more optimistic without about a, your without head? A, well, look, without a doubt, and I think the other thing I'd say, as I said, inconsistent was the other way because despite the challenges that we had there, we still still saw some outstanding results in the market. And it was really difficult for buyers to sit there or anyone in the market and, and understand really what the theme was because the theme kept changing. Yeah. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head as we head into 2024 already, even in the last two weeks since we've had this updated inflation data, you've seen that the sentiments changed. We've seen sort of there's, the, there's more excitement in, in calls that you're making. People are out there with briefs. People that were sitting on the fence are going, OK, my time's come. I'm, I might be ready to do something. And I think we're really going to see a lift in transaction volumes as we head through 2024. Yeah. And Steve, uh, so Steve, you're from LMG. So do you want to tell us quickly a little bit about your role and who LMG are? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're an aggregation group. Uh, so we've got 5,000 brokers across Australia and, and a largest group uh, in New Zealand as well. Uh, and within that, we've got a subset of brokers who are focused purely on commercial lending or, or they're, they're primary uh, commercial specialists. Uh, so what my team does is sort of propagate commercial lending. Aggregators have typically been more focused on the residential lending, uh, whereas our team's sort of dedicated to how we grow um, our commercial flows. Uh, in terms of what we experienced last year, um, we, we actually ended up in 23 uh, on par with 22 so, okay. so that was a really good result um, but it wasn't a linear journey uh, it was very back-ended um, we, we sort of went through a period during the middle of the year where you know off the back of what was it 13 um, consecutive rate rises that um, people as you say were, were sitting on their hands yeah. uh, and I think the messaging that we needed out there wasn't necessarily that rate cuts are coming um, but we've probably reached the end of the rises. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that, you know, the, our brokers reported that, that that was when the sort of sentiment, you know, started to change from the there. The confidence concise. is such a massive thing. Like the chain, the se- like that just, and, and also then the saying, the sentiment um, starts to shift, people start doing a bit more activity and that's it. It's kind of, we're all jumping on the bandwagon, confidence improves and it's, yeah, hopefully a much, uh, you know, clearer 2024 when it comes to the commercial space. Uh, So with that, let's probably talk through a few of the asset classes that will be a pretty interesting one to do. So what I want to start on is actually development sites. So development sites obviously is a a commercial um, investment. And I want to talk about development sites because they had a really rough last couple of years, to be completely honest. Construction prices grew ridiculous. 
Uh, so the feasibility of a lot of these things made it quite difficult. Um, we've started to see that moderate. Still growing, but it's mm. definitely moderated. Uh, but the flip side, we've, we've got a huge population. It's not a New South Wales story around the country, more of a Queensland story really than anywhere else. Um, WA as well. We've seen house prices, unit prices really rise considerably despite those interest rate movements. Yeah. Mm. The lack of uh, rental stock with all these people coming on. So one would think that development sites are tipped for a bit of an improve this year. What do you, what's your thoughts on that, Steve? Um, Sam? I agree with you. I mean, even this morning, Vanessa, there's an article in the paper and you can't, it's almost daily where we're getting these reports about undersupply of stock, where about population growth and about sort of, it's now becoming this sense of urgency. So the fact that we saw sort of very minimal transactions in this space last year was, was certainly surprising. Um, and it all, again, comes down to the feasibility element. And we had values holding, that's great. We think that we might have finance move a little bit, that's even gonna be better. And I think what we need to see is people have more confident, having more confidence that those construction costs are starting to come back. Mm -hmm. And that's when I think we'll have people go out and sort of start new projects. I, I'd also say, you know, there was a big, there was a big sort of, I mean, development science incorporates a lot of things, right? So we go low, medium, high density. Mm -hmm. If you were low density, medium density, and if, if you are sort of townhouses, duplexes, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. the demand for that is still extreme. Mm -hmm. Yes. The smaller the, the amount of ex, um, excavation, even better. People can get in there, they can keep those construction costs low, and they've got to keep their teams moving. Yes. Where that feasibility sort of died as you get into that higher density market. Yeah. And I think that's where we're probably going to see, there's a lot of, you know, we speak to a lot of owners every day, um, to, whether they be developers or builders, they've got sites. They might not be ready to, to deliver them, they might want to flick them on, and they're, they're getting ready to make those decisions. So I think we'll see them come back to market. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see those guys that have probably been more focused on delivering their existing pipeline come back into the purchasing side because these are now being delivered and they're ready to restock. Yeah. So if the feasibility works with us, if those construction numbers continue to come down a little bit, I definitely think we're going to see a big, a big uptick in confidence and in transactions for that. I suppose there's the construction price element, but also that labour piece, and I think that there's been some improvement in that labour piece as well. So reportedly, like, yeah, yeah. So that, like that's a, that's a good news story. Absolutely. Um, and also as uh, planning. Planning though is, is continue to be a stumbling block. So, you know, you could have, and we're talking about things that don't have a lot of excavation. So, mm. you know, big inglobo sites yep. um, primed for subdivision. Yep. As long as we can get through the servicing and the delivery via the planning mechanisms, well, like, you know, it should be a no brainer that those things come to the market. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, so, so obviously the finance piece is, is a massive part yep. for the development site market. So, the construction finance as well as the, the actual land financing. Is there a lot of, is there much of an appetite? Um, by the banks or your lenders that you're dealing with for this sort of product? Yeah, there is, uh, and, and certainly it's stronger than it has been. Um, but the appetite, particularly amongst the banks, is, is for high quality projects. Um, you know, that they want uh, an area that they believe in and they want to work with a sponsor that has a track record. Yeah. So someone that's delivered in the past, um, and particularly with, potentially with that bank, uh, that would go a long way. Um, I, th I think what we're seeing is that you know, a, a lot of the major banks, and this is probably where we say the bit about views of those of my own and <laughs> anyone else, but, um, you know, they've got um, big portfolios and, and some of that is linked to sort of the office space, CBD, um, and they know that there's this revaluation that, that, that's coming. So they're really looking to bolster their portfolio with quality um, stock mm -hmm. um, that sort of will lift the overall um, quality of the portfolio. So I think that's what we'll see that, um, that there's appetite and, and some of the lenders are actually quite um, open to do business but they want to make sure that they're, they're good quality um, developments that they're yeah. uh, participating in. And also who they're dealing with, like obviously the building sector has been devastated yeah. over the last couple of years, a lot of builders falling over and that's obviously a key consideration for them. 100%. Having that Having that track record that I've delivered on a project previously, um, and particularly if you have that relationship with a with bank and you've, you, you've proven to them in the past, that goes a long way. Um, that being said, uh, you know, one of the beauties of, of, of um, being a broker is that you have access to a number of lenders. We've, we've got 30 plus commercial lenders that sit on our, our um, uh, we, we partner with, and you know, there, there's probably a, a, some solutions 
that won't be met by major banks. And there's a, a range of non-bank lenders that are really pushing hard into that space. Uh, talking with uh, one of them recently, uh, they used to do uh, a weekly view of, let's have a look at all the development opportunities in their pipeline. What are the ones that, you know, the projects that, that they want to bank? That's now a daily meeting, wow. uh, yeah, well. simply because uh, the amount of uh, opportunities that they're seeing. So second tier lenders were such a feature of the market for the last few years, yeah, across all asset classes. But mm. so there's definitely still an appetite for those second tier lenders. Absolutely, um, yeah. So, so for those non-bank lenders, they, they really are, you know, filling in the, the space that some of the stuff that majors were previously doing. Uh, and and then there's a, a group of lenders that I guess previously we, we'd referred to as private lenders. Um, and, and I'm not sure if that name's appropriate into the future because some of these are really well funded. Um, they, they've got their own lines. Um, and and, and they, again, they're probably more aggressive, uh, but there's a price. Um, they, they more sort of rate for risk basis. Uh, they've still got to believe in the project. They've still got to you know, have confidence in it, uh, but they certainly will be more aggressive than say your banks or, or non-bank lenders. So um, Sam, the, like the sentiment obviously is, is probably ringing true about what Steve is saying, uh, location. Without a doubt. Location just yeah. is, is key. I mean, it's, it's the age old, like the location, location, location <laughs> is sort of the foundation of real estate, right? Yeah. And, that, and we saw that sort of happen last year and continue into this year. If you're, it goes without saying, if you've got a site, probably regardless of the density that's in sort of a high profile blue ribbon area, um, that's in a high growth area, that's in a, a site with sort of major major undersupply or a little bit of undersupply, that gives that extra bit of confidence because the developer can have more confidence because they know that their bank is, that's something that the bank's going to look at. Yeah. If you're sort of in an area that, that's sort of inundated where your, your pre-sales are going to take a long time, where, you know, that's where, where there's a little bit less certainty around what the future of that market looks like, that's that's obviously when that, that was giving people pause for thought. Yeah. And the infrastructure as well, like public transport, those sort of things. So there's obviously so many infrastructure projects going on around the country. Of course. However, it needs to be a bit more advanced before we're seeing a lot of take up of that kind of development site stock. Are people getting in early or is there a trend to that? Or I think it, um, people, it's a little bit of both. There's certainly a lot of inquiry at probably the earlier stages for that. And that will that you see comes down to, I suppose, terms. So if we're, there's a bit of planning risk around that, if there is a little bit of uncertainty around sort of how long it might take, even if it's not planning, if it's more sort of council driven, you, you'll still find that there's you can create urgency and excitement if, if the vendor might be prepared to give a little bit of ter some terms around that. Yeah. Give a bit of time so that that gives the purchase and purchaser some time to go away and do their homework. It's not about due diligence. That's, a, that's almost a swear word in, in agency wherever possible, <laughs> but um, it is like settlement time can, can often be very helpful. So you might find that you get to the same price if you can offer sort of you know more favourable terms around timing. Okay. Well, that's so it's interesting you talk about the infrastructure projects and um, the discussion you had earlier around availability of labour. Certainly some of the reports we're getting, particularly out of Victoria, is that for some of the smaller developments that's posing a bit of a challenge. Okay. Uh, just that um, you know, there, there is so much infrastructure work going on that some of the builders are having you know, well, difficult access isn't to, it? to trades. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's exactly right, because mm. they're just in direct competition with, you know, the, everyone else that wants to try to do some building and renovating. Yeah, and that obviously then blows out times as well. When you when you can't get the trade, that delays your project, which yeah. creates an issue back with the bank or your funder or your private lender who's mm. waiting to recall money, and through no fault of your own, weather events, you're delayed. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that, that certainly brought, I think, a little bit of distress and, mm -hmm. and probably some distressed assets to the market that we saw last year, yeah. which was a direct result of, you know, labour shortage and things like that. Um, so that's development sites. I, look, I just think it's going to be the year of development sites. We're going to see far more um, activity happening in that space. And not residential, but as well as, you know, the industrials and yeah. things of the world too. Absolutely. But on to more kind of traditional commercial asset classes. Um, office, I, everyone probably knows I'm pretty down on office. Um, <laughs> the, like you can't dispute, like the recent data from MSCI came out and all the returns are pretty dire. Um, but okay, um, yeah. occupancy is still pretty low, but there's, that's an opportunity, massive opportunity um, for people to get into the market. Mm. Uh, retail, we've seen more retail sales at the start of this year than any other. We're seeing a lot of people jumping onto retail, little centres and individual shops and yeah, much more activity. Uh, and then there's industrial. Industrial has been the golden child for so many years. And if you're looking at kind of returns and things, still 
doing reasonably well. Mm. Do you have any, what's your thoughts on those kind of traditional markets? Do you think one's going to get ahead of the other or is there going to be more activity people are going to stay away from? Look, I don't necessarily know that people will stay away from, from certain asset classes, like especially your owner occupier. If they've got a demand for it, they're, they're going to buy it. Mm -hmm. I think if you're an investor in the market, industrial, definitely still a big flavour. You generally find that your covenants are a little bit longer if you're an investor coming in there or you're an owner occupier that needs that space. Mm -hmm. And industrial is still so limited in supply, and I think that's that sort of you know big part of the reason that we've seen such a spike in those values and continued demand. Yeah. And we're already seeing that a little bit this year, as much as sort of assets are just coming into the market. Um, I think sort of in terms of other asset classes, anything from an investor perspective that has sort of a, a guaranteed return, and sort of by that, you know, whether you're talking about sort of service stations or or, or an, a covenant that that might be listed or that might have sort of certainty of tenure, I think is going to give people a lot of confidence. And in the absence of that, I think you just made the point about retail, sort of little centres where you have diversification of income, so not all your eggs are in sort of one yeah. basket. I think that's going to be really popular because you can stomach one vacancy sort of here or here if you're buying an asset that might have sort of multiple different components. And that just gives you a little bit of comfort. If one goes, I've still got, I can, you know, I'm not sort of there holding the baby, so yeah. to speak, with for everything. So I think that's, it'll be the, those, those diversified income and, and a bit of industrial that goes along there as well. And um, for you, Steve, so is yeah. there any, uh, with, with your broker network, yeah. is there any particular asset class that seems to be getting more inquiry or more popular that you're doing more deals in, in the commercial space? Yeah, health is um, almost a, an ongoing one. So we're one moving that, away from the traditional yeah. office, <laughs> retail and industrial, and we're going yeah. to the alternate straight yeah. <laughs> Well, I, 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 one thing that's, I think, really interesting around the office space is um, we've seen a couple of you know, Australia's largest employers come out and, and have policy now around sort of work from home and how often you, you need to be in the office. Um, we have in sort of labour surveys, uh, often the number one thing is flexibility. So it, it does feel, I don't think we've landed, it, it does feel yeah. like um, what the em employee is saying that they value and, and what the employer is setting as an expectation. I think there's a bit to play out there. Yeah. Uh, and, and my view is that we'll see more and more people back in the office on a, on a regular basis. Yeah, I think that's gonna, that's just gonna take time to play through. Mm. Um, but the, well, how that translates to actually occupied demand and that means rents rising and the values of assets mm. coming back up is, is a different story. But no, I don't mean to interrupt your medical discussion. Let's talk about medical. <laughs> oh no, so um, look, that's, we, we've just seen that, you know, that that's, that's a, a popular area. I, I think probably the trend more in, in our industry is uh, around brokers um, specialising to a particular industry. Mm -hmm. um, often a commercial broker was a commercial broker. Um, now we're seeing more and more say, uh, I'll align myself to pharmacy, I'll align myself to you know the hospitality in industry um, and become, childcare. childcare's a big one, become deeply specialised. Uh, and the advantage of that is um, lender appetite and for credit, it's not static. Uh, often a, a lender you know, will say, oh, I'm all in on this particular area and they have a big run on it. And then all of a sudden, well, I need to balance my portfolio so I, you know, I'm not after as much childcare as, as I was previously. Mm -hmm. So having someone who spends their time deeply understanding the market uh, for a particular industry type, um, w we've seen that, you know, that they've got some really good results for their customers as of you know, being so close to it. Mm. Well, that makes sense. Mm. Uh, because of course the the um, offerings of the all the lenders change all the time, and like you said, their appetite changes for those sort of alternative assets, and they have over. They got portfolios to balance. Yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, the smaller the lender, um, the more nimble or agile they'll be, and and the more reactive that they need to be. That for, for you know some small lenders, um, you know, a couple of really big transactions absolutely changes their outlook on a, on an industry type. Mm. Uh, you've had some success with this kind of the alternative sector. Mm. You've been doing a lot of work in that. Like it was obviously, it's been a massive um, commercial investor for the last, oh, you know, asset class for people to invest in. Mm. Um, I remember doing a piece late last year and we looked at year on year on year and it just kind of, despite the fact that volumes totally had kind of fallen, that, that part of the pie kept on growing. Mm. Um, do we think that we're still going to see that um, coming into this year or do you think there'll be a bit more, um, I don't know, consideration around other factors because it got to a point where you kind of felt people were just jumping in and buying 
um, well, well, it had a return, but now with, with the cost of finance being so much higher, yeah. will we see some of that kind of demand for those, uh, you know, service stations and your child cares and your like kind of come back a little bit? Do you have a thought on that? Oh, I don't know necessarily that the demand will come back. And I think, you know, alternative asset class is such is so like broadly encompassing, right? So it yeah. can sort of, it can refer to, we've mentioned childcare, we mentioned service station, medical, I think boarding houses probably sort of fit into that category as well and definitely seen a, a bit of an uptick in demand for those. I think if we look at, uh, obviously we talk about undersupply of rental availability and, and of diversification of income, that's really charging sort of people into mm. that space. I'm marketing one at the moment. Interest has been outstanding and, and once upon a time those, those sort of assets were really hard to lift. Yeah. I think childcare still, is still going to be popular. Um, you know, we've get a lot, childcare's been massive for now a couple of years, so we have a lot of centres. Yes. And we're going to get to some areas which are now oversupplied. oversupplied. Yeah. And so I think, and, and we also, as, as new asset classes sort of come through, people get more and more educated about them. Mm -hmm. There are now three or four websites that people can jump on and they can have a line of sight over what the actual demand in that area is. Yeah. I don't need to tell you this, but in, in seconds. Yeah. So you've got, yes, I do think childcare will be popular, but I think it will be sort of area specific and yes. it will depend on what that supply is yeah and the same goes for sites yeah. medicals probably a little bit sort of less subject to that if you've got a, a strong covenant again you know you, if you're going in and buying an asset either as an operator you're looking for you, you, you're a bit emotional because you need a premises to actually that it's going to work for you as, yeah. as as an operator there or you're buying a tenant that sort of has set up their practice there and they intend to be there for a while so you've got that yeah. sort of security there as well so mm. I think that'll be continue to be strong I think those that probably bought a couple of years ago, um, you know, where interest, where, where cap rates did get very, very tight, sort of if they were trying to resell in, in sort of the market that we've just been through, where obviously we have seen an adjustment, that's been hard, but yeah. these guys are probably going to elect to hold and, until we see that sort of balancing act a little bit. Yeah, so definitely. hard to put your finger on it, but, but I, I love think the, there'll be activity. The um, boarding houses, that's such an interesting one, because like, you know, a lot of people think boarding houses and they think, some pretty bad things but like they're pretty like the ones that have been built in more recent times they're high quality assets and they really serve serve the need of this kind of housing issue that we do have across the country without a yeah. doubt and yeah they're, they're like a lot, lot of demand mm. for them there has been for a number a lot they're quite tightly held um, yeah. some of particularly blocks of units blocks of units another one kind of those um, a mixture of old and newer um, apartment buildings, sometimes strated, sometimes not. Great exit strategies there as well, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of demand. NDIS, yeah, yeah. Um, disability yeah, housing. Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, yeah, and you know, finding the right funders for, for that isn't necessarily always easy, but yeah, there's tr tremendous demand um, and yeah, sort of great opportunity. Mm. Yeah. So I, um, a piece I wrote at the end of last year and I remember chatting to you about it, Sam, and I think I had Block of Units actually as our number one kind yeah. of, for my number one kind of pick for this year. It just makes a whole lot of sense to undersupply the rental growth um, and the, the, you know, the multiple exit strategies you've got from a, an asset that's residential is, is, pretty, um, is, is pretty fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so what's, your, what's, your, what's the opportunity then? What's what do you for what, unit blocks? No, what's no? Oh, no, what's the opportunity for two thousand twenty-four commercial or things? I'm not going to do the whole if you've got them, you know, <laughs> ten million dollars or hundred million dollars. What yeah, you're buying? Yeah, for sure. Um, but you know, like you, you speak to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of lot more inquiry. People yep. are feeling a lot more upbeat about this year. Yeah. I think sort of anything that has the opportunity for sort of you know, to, to manage your risk a little bit is going to be really popular. We spoke about sort of strong covenants there. I'm going to use unit blocks as an example. Like people love them and they still transact on really sort of tight cap rates because you've usually, and not all of them, but you've got an opportunity here. Your vacancy is often quite low, but again, diversified. You repositioning, especially, or as in sort of, you've got the opportunity in some of them to strata and, and sell them down and maybe sort of refunction some debt around that or obviously redevelopment as well. So a lot of these in sort of high density areas, you've got other things going up around them. There might be a land bank now mm -hmm. with sort of opportunity for the future. I think that's, that's we're gonna see sort of more of that come into the space, but there's only so many. They're oh, not gonna be able to transact say, like, forever. And yeah, whoever yeah. owns them though, they're like, yeah. they're holding on to them because oh, they, they're, they're, they're great assets. And if you land definitely. bank, then you're like, you know, holding on to them. Mm. And 
um, yeah, there's a lot of lot of privates. Absolutely, older and privates that that own these mm. these assets, and um, yeah, that's. And, and once upon a time, they, these sort of things transacted sort of on on wholesale, really. But now we're yes. kind of getting to 100%. to a point where they're they're actually so you're paying a little bit more than retail. So you know you sort of got to be you've got to be careful to as to how how these things are sort of priced, and and the demand will will depend on sort of what the outcome is of that is and what the alternatives for the asset are as well. So while that's the that's the pick for the year, where mm. do you think there's um, you know, some opportunity, uh, is there opportunity in things, like a lot of people always talk about the repositioning of office into like living sectors, which can't yeah. happen. Like, well, it can happen for older style, really older style assets that still have natural light and yeah. high ceilings and those sort of things. Yeah. Um, is there any other kind of asset classes that you can think of any kind of major opportunities or is it just be ready, look at the, the cause there's gonna be distressed sales. Do we think, what's your thoughts on distressed sales for this year? Oh, I don't, look, Everybody, even if you go right back to the beginning of COVID, everybody was sort of waiting for this cliff that was inevitably coming where sort of there was going to be this free fall in asset values. And we just haven't seen that come through. And we haven't sort of seen that volume of distressed asset sales come through, mm -hmm. or at least that we know about. There's a lot of people out in the market that are probably sort of, you know, making their own decisions to, to sort of sell before the decision is kind of Made taken away them, yeah. from them. Um, and you know, that that's 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 not a one size fits all approach by by any stretch. But I think that those coming into the market now, it's all about sort of the urgency in the sale. If if you're selling a property now or if you and you you've probably got a genuine appetite to, might not be a need, but you're selling it now because you want to redeploy the capital that you've got into that into another opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I think anybody that's out there buying is going to, to see good opportunities. They might not be dirt cheap, but they're probably sort of solid market investments. Yeah. If, if it's priced right, uh, if you create a little bit of urgency around it, and if you're sort of, you, you create some social proof by being in the market, mm -hmm. my view is it'll sell. Yeah, okay. And I think our lenders do deserve some credit for um, the way that they've worked with, with customers um, in more recent times. You know, there's a tremendous amount of support was available uh, through COVID. Um, you know, we've got, with the rates continuing to rise, there's some covenants, financial covenants that uh, haven't been met, that they're now working with them. You know, how do we you know, get a good solution? So I think this, um, the first reaction of sell it up or it becomes an asset that, that has to go, you know, I, I think we're, we're a little past that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's a constructive way to, to look at this. Mm -hmm. There'll certainly be people that'll fall into the, that category, but, but hopefully, you know, most there'll be equity and, and the ability to, to get out of these situations. But, but I do think the attitude um, by a lot of our lenders has helped that. And just to, um, for a last point maybe is, uh, with, the, with the lenders, is there, is there something that someone can do to their property or, um, that makes it more attractive to, to financiers, or is it really more about the relationship that the, you know, that the the prospective purchaser has with uh, the lender, or is, is there anything that property specific that can be done, or is it just more about the relationship? I think less property specific. Um, I think it's more about finding the right lender with that appetite. Um, so, shopping it. Yeah. Uh, you know, if the ability to have someone scour the market for you. Um, not everyone has the same appetite, not everyone views uh, each uh, asset the same, uh, and, and some will be far more aggressive on price if you know that's a segment that, that they want to bank. So I think it's, it's probably the best tip is to sort of have a look around the market and, and see what terms you, you can attract. Yeah. Well, I think that's all we really have time for today, but this was a really great chat. So thanks so much to, to Stephen and to Sam uh, for joining us and talking all things commercial property um, and lending, which is great to have you have you come and talk to us from LMG. Uh, so thank you, everyone. As always, you can go back and watch uh, this or share it with your friends uh, or your, your contacts, your clients, whoever it is on um, YouTube. You can also, um, after like later on today, I'll pop that on um, our Spotify channel. So as always, jump on, search Ray White commercial uh, between between the lines live any of those kind of words you put in there you'll, you'll find it and um, feel free to listen to this one and go back and to listen to some of our other ones um, last thing I told I um, Carolyn Cummins if anyone knows who she is she's the uh, property editor at Sydney Morning Herald it's her birthday today so happy birthday and if you know her please send her a message and wish her happy birthday because Valentine's Day often gets lost uh, and the last thing is next month so we're back on track we've got a pretty full year of uh, between the lines live events coming up the next one is on the 13th of March. Uh, I'll be here in Sydney and it's gonna be a really good one. 
It's going to be about the hotel market. So we will have um, Adam Ellis from our valuations team and also um, Andrew Jackson from HTL talking about accommodation hotels. Um, if any of you read my piece, I just came out this week talking about Taylor Swift and the effect on hotel prices. Uh, you'll love to tune into that one next month. So we'll see you next month and uh, feel free to share, like, all that sort of thing with uh, um, our all of our information that we've got. It's really exciting to have you guys on board. So see you next time.